new book about climate change. I'm very excited to see uh, what sort of ideas Mr. Gates is posing here, so I'll just give it a quick read, shall we? I have questions. Hello everyone, it's Michaela here, and one of the biggest problems with climate change is figuring out which solutions to implement at which time. Between electrifying the energy grid, nuclear power, biofuels, air heaters, th there's a lot of things that you can do. But that doesn't mean you should do everything. While it is generally true that in most cases, every solution we have should be applied to wherever it fits the best, uh, there's some solutions that, if we were to pursue them, might be more wasteful and more dirty than pursuing another option. And so, and that's sort of the question that Bill Gates tries to tackle in this book. To be fair, it's actually a very good read. He really lays out climate change for the average non-scientist. I think his climate communication is very good, and I also think that he covers a lot of solutions that we're going to be needing in the future. But I do take issue with a large section of this book, and that is the book containing the topic of biofuels. So biofuels are like this kind of weird person at the party. You don't really know what their whole deal is. You don't really think about them all too much. They seem nice, but you really don't know one way or the other. Because when I talk to people about biofuels, their first question is usually, what's a biofuel? I've never heard of that before. Biofuels are a branch of clean energy. The idea is rather than getting your automobile's fuel from the ground and then burning it, you grow plants or use plant material to make your fuel and then burn it. The way that this is supposedly clean energy is because it's a net zero carbon process. The tree takes in carbon to grow. That's how trees get mass. They're organic matter, so they have to take in carbon dioxide to get their carbon along with minerals and stuff from the roots. So they take in all this carbon dioxide to grow. And if you grow plants for that purpose, the carbon dioxide in the air goes down a little bit. But then you take that tree and you burn it. And all that carbon dioxide that was stored from when it grew gets released into the world and you now, technically, have a process that didn't add any extra carbon that wasn't already there before. These biofuels can be grown from a number of different plants, uh, and the primary two countries that are the biggest producers of biofuels are the United States and Brazil. You can use soybeans, corn, wood waste, other plant matter waste, and then the newer biofuels are actually looking to be used from algae. Bill Gates talks about these biofuels a lot in his book, and in the transportation section, he makes a point to highlight how effective biofuels would be in the market for green and renewable fuels. The only problem he cites uh, with biofuels is they're not completely green and they're too expensive right now. His primary stance seems to be we need to learn how to do more research on biofuels to make them less expensive, drive the cost down, and then make them suitable for implementation into other cars. But those two arguments aren't all of the restrictions for biofuels. Part one. I didn't think of a part name. I just said part one. Uh, hold on, I'll think of it. Part one, how clean are biofuels? Random citizen. So to understand why biofuels are significantly more dirty uh, than most estimates are giving, it pays to look at something called an opportunity cost. In economics and in life, doing nothing is an actual decision. If we're presented with some choices, either choice A, B, C, or do nothing, Doing nothing has a cost associated with it. So opportunity cost is essentially the cost that comes from making a choice because you didn't do something else. And this comes in big play when biofuels are concerned, because although biofuels are advertised as green alternatives because you are growing crops and then using them for their fuel, the opportunity cost of biofuels is very, very large because oftentimes the land that is used for biofuels was originally forested, which means there are already trees growing there, absorbing carbon, growing, and potentially having a larger carbon dioxide absorption density than the biofuels. So if you have a patch of land that was originally free growing trees and you clear it 
to make a biofuel field. The opportunity cost of making that biofuel field is all the carbon dioxide that you could have absorbed if you would have just left the forest alone. Additionally, there are many ecological disadvantages to tilling all of that land for biofuels, for corn, for crops, uh, for all those things you would need to actually make the fuel. As you can imagine, growing crops is a very land intensive process. And so researchers have calculated the land use change, which is essentially how much CO2 is actually being emitted by using these fields for your biofuels. And the answer is actually significantly more than expected. The models to calculate biofuels have varied. The breakout paper published in Science that first took a look at this actually estimated that using corn-based ethanol for the biofuels, rather than saving 20% off of the emissions, actually doubled the greenhouse gas emissions over 30 years. And the reason for this is simply because they are converting forested area into very low efficiency plants that they would then burn later. However, over the years, models have improved and scientists have sort of zeroed in on a slightly more accurate estimate of biofuels and their trade-offs. In the next paper, Environmental Review Letters actually found that the carbon intensity of corn ethanol is 46% lower than that of gasoline. 46% seems like a lot, but when you think about the fact that we have to get to 0% within the next 20 years, that becomes much less desirable. <laughs> But luckily, Bill Gates and other research in the community addresses a solution to this low efficiency problem, and that is algal production of biofuels. Using algae to produce biofuels is actually a really, really interesting process. Instead of like growing plants and corn and all this low efficiency garbage, you're actually leaving the forests alone and then growing algae in wetlands. Algae actually is much, much denser than plants and grows much, much faster than traditional plants, and therefore is much, much more energy dense than plants. In fact, whereas maize-based biofuels only make about 400 gallons per acre, microalgae biofuels can make up to 5,000 gallons of biofuels per acre. The only problem with microalgae-based biofuels is they are much, much, much more expensive. In fact, over twice as expensive, if I'm not mistaken. Am I mistaken? I might be mistaken. I'm usually mistaken. They're here somewhere. What chapter was it? Let's give, let's give it a second. See what it does. See how it be. You know, I was right. Which brings me to the second issue that I see with biofuels, which is scale up and applicability. So I am a chemical engineer. No one cares. My job is literally to take science that people have created and ask the questions, is this feasible in the real world? And how can we make it feasible in the real world? Furthermore, if this is feasible in the real world, how can we expand it to be able to help everyone we're trying to help with this technology? If you have the cure for cancer, but literally no way of getting it or producing it for anyone, what good is it? So that's the biggest piece for me of analyzing biofuels. And so the part two is I want to talk about how biofuels have a scale up problem. The scale up problem has to do with how much land you need for biofuels. Now, if you want to make biodiesel from this, the U.S. uses approximately 47.2 billion gallons of diesel per year. If you wanted to make all of that with microalgae, you would need about 9.4 million acres of algae farms. The problem is there's only 8.8 .8 million acres of farms and environments in the U.S. that is suitable for making algae, which means that if we wanted to use biofuels for everything, we can't because we would need more of algae farmable lakes and environments than literally exists in the US. And this isn't even counting cars, this is just diesel. Expand that to how many cars are also on the road that need fueling, and then expand that further to the fact that we need to we would need to power the entire world with this stuff. The scalability is, is right now appears very, very, very infeasible from a numbers perspective and a land perspective. Of course, there is technology on making hyper-dense algae reactors uh, a way, so you don't need an algae lake to actually create this biofuel. But that technology is very, very, very far away from implementation, and it is incredibly, incredibly expensive. So even though Bill Gates seems to think algae is the, the sort of magic bullet for transportation-based emissions, he's really neglecting the mathematics and the engineering of scale-up applicability 
And the last piece, policy. As I mentioned, the two biggest producers of biofuels are the US and Brazil. Uh, Brazil actually is one of the biggest biofuel giants. Uh, they have, I believe, over 80% of their cars are able to run on either fuel, biofuel, or a mixture of both. However, they don't explicitly force cars to use just biofuel. A lot of cars in Brazil are hybrids, which means they could use regular gasoline or biofuel gasoline. It's flexible, but that means if you're trying to make everything really, really green, your biofuels are already only 46% better than gasoline, and you're now mixing biofuels and regular gasoline uh, in sort of a hybrid engine, so not even all of a consumer's fuel would be from biofuel. It makes it hard to think that policy would be able to aggressively force folks to just use biofuels for their engines especially since the sheer volume needed and the space constraints I mentioned earlier are keeping biofuels from becoming a huge global source. So what is the solution? Is there any hope for biofuels? The question is, what is the opportunity cost of putting all of our nation's resources into that technology? Could our time and money and policy be better used fixing our cities, providing better public transport, rolling out electric vehicles on a mass scale? rather than working and working and working to create a biofuel industry that at most will only cover maybe 10 to 15 percent of our transportation needs i don't claim to have the complete answer to that question but we are actively researching ways that we can make it suitable for everybody i think that we should focus more on more folks getting electric cars driving less and improving our public transportation structure to use trains, interconnected rail systems, uh, electrified fleets of buses and public transport vehicles, those sorts of urban planning, infrastructural policy driven changes with electric vehicles, I think are a more efficient route to getting to zero transportation based emissions within a reasonable time frame. I hope that you all learned a little bit of something about biofuels. I hope you got a better appreciation for the complexities of trying to figure out how to get to zero emissions on a large scale. Um, I'm going to keep posting updates about my work uh, at the World Bank, uh, creating a transportation-based plan that will be sent to policyholders and government officials. Very excited about that project. Follow me on Twitter uh, to get updates on that. Follow this channel to get more science and engineering videos, and get an electric car if you can. We'll figure this out. We will figure this out together. It's going to be fun. Ah, it's gonna be fun. I swear, staring into the void of climate change reality, like on the daily, because it's like something that's like my job is very existentially draining. I think I'm gonna go watch some TV, but you all stay great, uh, stay learning, and I'll see you in the next video.